Well, um, I understand that Master that you're involved in the Commissar Infrastructure Fund, uh, in addition to obviously leading a regional development bank. I mean, clearly you must have to contend with a lot of these regional, um, cross-border, multi-jurisdictional issues in, in your projects. How, how do you get those projects, how do you conceive them and, and just figure out how to create an opportunity for you to get your product out the door to finance those projects? And then on the equity side, if you've got this fund, you obviously have to look at it from both of those perspectives. How do you manage that risk and bring the parties along? Thank you, Hubert. Well, yes, uh, it's, it's, it's actually very complex in that we're dealing with multiple authorities, but at the same time with a whole range of players, everybody on this panel we deal with. I think, I think the problem we, we find is at the regional level, there is a lot of aspiration, but when it comes down to practicalities, not everybody reads the level of commitment to be the same. And a lot of, the, a lot of right things are said, but in reality, when the real priority comes, uh, you don't see decisions being made in a particular way. You see that we don't want power? No, no it's, it's just that I think it's more closer to what Jay was alluding to, that there, there are so many constraints and challenges and gaps within, within countries themselves that before people want to start really talking about serious commitments to regional projects, you get you get a very strong nationalistic perspective. Not because, uh, you know, countries are not interested in regional solutions, it's just that from, from a control point of view, from an alignment of interest point of view, you just don't always find uh, the action following the webs. I mean, in that way. Some of these are mega projects, they take a very long time, there's just too many players that have to come together and make it work. Right. Whereas, if it's within your own borders, it's a lot easier to get it done. I think the countries that benefit from this are the large countries. If you're a small country, you suffer because the smaller countries actually need regional projects to work better because of scale considerations, economies of scale. So I think that's the the, the challenge of, 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 of regional projects. You have the second layer. You have dependencies that are not always so obvious. And you actually have to read in between the lines because Set. I think at the, at the country level, at the project level, it's much more straightforward. I think the de-risking has been going on for quite some time. We see it as a bank. Our portfolio reflects it. We have a lot more power projects in our portfolio than we did five years ago, certainly ten years ago. You see you see players like GE now very strong on the ground. Five years ago, I don't think GE was very strong on the ground. There's many others like that. And from an appetite point of view, I think uh, the market risk issue that was highlighted is, 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 is a risk area that has really been uh, addressed from a tariffing point of view. At least from the get-go now, we know that it's, it's bankable in that sense. You know, nobody's asking you to invest in a Wall Street enterprise, which is what most of our utilities have been for the longest time. So I mean, I think if you look at it from that point of view, there's been a lot of de-risking going on with the liberalization of the market. We've seen other infrastructure sectors do exceedingly well in the past 10 or 15 years. So you know, this is not a pipe dream. Infrastructure actually is a good business. We've seen it in a number of sectors. The water is trailing behind. It's very complex. The power is catching up very quickly. And when you look at the, the discussions, when you look at the focus of the whole range of players, you can see that the focus is no longer so much at the macro level. We're narrowing in very, very, very sharply. The level of detail that's coming out even in this conversation today, really is the kind of conversations that come out in credit committees. So very detailed issues where you need practical solutions uh, to get projects off the ground. So it's no longer a question of, you know, banking a sovereign or a utility. You know, the, the, the liberalization has happened, the pricing is okay. There are sponsors, there are technical partners who get it right. Are we too complex in the way that you say credit committees take a very different view on things, the way that entrepreneurs and business <coughs> business people are? Uh, is there a, a, any chance of a slight risk that we're, we're letting perfect become the enemy of good? I mean, we have, we have a group of lawyers turning around talking about a, a recent project in Nigeria. The This power project closed um, in uh, the fourth quarter of last year, $20 million uh, legal bill. You know, but most of those lawyers, if you speak to them individually, were saying, well, we probably could have got, got this through at half the level of complexity that we all put, but of course we're fighting, and that probably adds a lot of cost, a lot of time. In terms of the investment risk analysis, are we, are we only satisfied with perfect, or is there a good level that, you know, 
that we could think about or should think about, or is that just not, not even contemplated? I wouldn't say it's about perfection. I, I would say it has to do also with who's around the table and who's <coughs> carrying what extent of the can, if you like. I think um, sometimes implementing partners don't always realize that they have, uh, once they have a contract from a financial institution, they're, they're home dry. They don't always pay attention to the fact that when things go wrong, it's a different type of player who's going to have to deal with the issue. I think there's a reason why financiers behave the way they do. I don't think it's because they're not interested. You have entities like ADB and ourselves who have a very strong public priority kind of uh, push around getting us to do these deals. But it's not for lack of interest or commitment. It has to do with, with, with real gaps on the ground. And, and, and so it's not, I don't think there is an issue of commitment on the part of financiers. I think there's been some very healthy conversation at the level of upstream gaps, the whole issue of feasibility, bankability, getting the risk capital to come in and, 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 and embed the project before you even start talking that capital. And of course, making sure the regulatory issues are there. So, so as a financier, um, everyone's touched on this whole issue of currency risk. How do you deal with currency risk? What innovations do you anticipate we'll be talking about in five years as it relates to currency risk in projects on the continent? Well, you know, we are often asked, uh, why do we always work in dollars? And the truth is, we don't just work in dollars. We, we issue bonds and other currencies in some of our member states. But the capital markets are not as deep as we'd like them to be. And the reality is, uh, for PPAs to be bankable, it has to be denominated in dollars in most countries because of the nature of the markets in those particular countries. So South Africa can have brand denominated PPAs because it's, it's a certain kind of country. Uh, maybe others like Algeria, Morocco, Egypt might be able to do the same. But, but most African countries, unfortunately, still have to rely on dollar PPAs. And it's complex, it's a macroeconomic issue. And so there's no way of getting around that, even though we have tried and we keep actually doing quite a bit. Even the markets won't, won't give you the amount of local currency you need. We have to get special regulatory approvals just to issue $25 million in a, in a country of 50 million people. So, so we're here at the ADB meetings, lots of ministers of finance, lots of central bank governors. What would your ask be in that respect? I, I, I would say accelerate the reforms that will allow African institutional investors to take the lead. Because I think once the rest of the world sees African capital really flowing in a serious way to infrastructure projects, IPPs, we've seen it in telecoms, I think the rest of the world will follow. I don't think it's fair to expect the rest of the world to come through. And your own money is, is sitting safely very far away. So it's the it's the sort of international pension and sovereign wealth fund here. Doing business in Africa. You can't afford to be without Africa Investor.